But writing is just one part of our life and how we feed our writing is by living our life. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Tara East. I'm a writer, blogger, YouTuber, and the author of the mystery novel, Every Time He Dies. In this week's video, I actually wanna talk about my personal obsession with writing and whether or not I think this is, you know, healthy. I've actually joked with my partner a lot about the fact that I'm really grateful that he's not a writer because basically it forces me to have conversations about stuff other than writing. Here's the thing. Writing takes up like 90% of my thoughts. I easily spend 6 to 12 hours a day writing or doing writing related activities, whether that be reading, proofing, brainstorming, or even teaching writing, and certainly creating all of my content for this YouTube channel and my blog and Instagram and all of that stuff. I don't really take days off unless I'm traveling, have out of town visitors, or if there's a backlog of errands that I've been ignoring and really need to tend to. And sometimes, not even then, sometimes I still squeeze writing in even around those things. So recently a friend of mine actually asked me what I do in my free time and I didn't have an answer. I was totally baffled. I sort of mumbled that I enjoy cooking, but very quickly I realized that my free time, when I have free time, is usually then spent socializing. That's when I would go and catch up with friends or family. And now here's the thing, writing used to be the thing that I did in my free time, but I've worked really hard to create a life where writing is at the center of it. I chose to pursue a doctorate in creative writing. And when I'm not working on that, I'm working on all of this online platform stuff, a space dedicated to sharing writing advice and adjacent tips such as time management and productivity. Now for years, so much of the non-fiction content I was consuming was still about writing. So I was listening to writing podcasts, reading writing blogs, watching writing YouTube channels, documentaries, and just eating writing craft books. And it actually got to the point where I wouldn't even watch a movie, like the only movies that appealed to me were movies that had writers in them or the main character was a writer or there was some sort of literary element in it. So recently I was watching an interview with an author and the interviewee mentioned a book by Phil Tetlock and it's called The Fox and the Hedgehog. And basically the book seeks to answer, is it better to be a generalist or a specialist? And after running a series of tests, they actually discovered that it's far better to be a generalist. Generalists tend to solve problems quicker and better than specialists. Now in this same vein, I have wondered whether my obsession with writing has actually shrunk my life. I wonder what important things I'm missing out on by being so devoted to this one area of my life. Is it okay to spend 90% of my time on 10% of who I am? Strangely, while most of my internal world is all about writing, much of my external world isn't. In all honesty, few friends actually ask about my writing or my writing life. And when they do, the conversation usually goes for about a minute, maybe. In the past, I really craved a writing community where I could really geek out on the craft, the business, and the life of being a writer. Fortunately, I now have friends that meet that need, but I also have created that space and met this craving through this YouTube channel and my blog and my other online spaces. Something that does trouble me though is how writing is consistently on my mind. If I find myself in a situation that is social light, as Sarah Wilson would describe it, social light being when you're in the company of other people, but you're not really connecting in any meaningful way because you're on your phone scrolling, or maybe you're watching TV together, or your conversation is just small talk and it never sort of goes beyond that. So in these social light situations, I usually see them as opportunities to, you know, leave. I always find myself thinking, they're distracted, they don't feel like talking, they're checking out, this is kind of a waste of time, I should really just scamper off and go and do some writing or something related to writing. 
depending on where I am, I often will go and do that thing. So rather than staying in the moment and asking that person to put down the phone or to switch off the TV or me making the effort to lift the conversation to a more meaningful space, I flee. And in that fleeing, I wonder what opportunity it is I'm missing out on. What revelation is going unrevealed because I've left the room? Recently, I spent a week helping out a friend at a pop-up restaurant. I did about 50 hours of work on my feet, and that didn't even include the travel time, which was 45 minutes there and back, so 90 minutes every day. At the end of this week, I was totally spent because I'm not really hospitality fit anymore. On my first day off, I vowed that I wouldn't do anything productive because I really needed to rest. I promised myself that I wouldn't open my laptop, work on my novel, work on my thesis, or do any of my contract paid work. Now, the first few hours of this day off were bliss. I lay in bed reading and I constantly filled up my teapot the moment it was empty. But by 10 a.m., I was climbing the walls. I was so restless and anxious and just squirmy. Now, for the record, I'm actually a pretty even-keeled kind of a person. I'm not terribly anxious. I don't get stressed out that much. But on this particular day, when I vowed not to do any work, and I didn't have any set tasks to sort of preoccupy myself with, like I didn't have any social engagements or even sort of any domestic chores that needed to be done, I just found myself feeling really uncomfortable. And then this led me to question whether writing or general busyness had become a kind of numbing activity. Where another person might check out by scrolling away on their phone or by reading listicles on BuzzFeed, I was using writing and productivity, which is, you know, the most socially accepted form of numbing, as a way to distract myself. The irony that most self-help books encourage people to use writing as a way to stop numbing out and to tune into their feelings doesn't escape me. Now, I found myself wondering, is it possible for writing to become a numbing activity or is writing, in fact, the exact tool that we all need to get our shit together? The only conclusion I can really come to is it depends. So recently, I started reading Natalie Goldberg's Thunder and Lightning, and in the opening pages, she actually describes an equally restless day where she was just dripping with despair. So she grabbed a friend who was in an equally icky state, and the two of them went and climbed a huge mountain, and when they got to the top, Nat turned to her friend and said, how do you feel? And her friend said, bad. So they jumped in their car and they drove to Natalie's house and they sat in meditation for an hour. Nat turned to her friend, how do you feel? Her friend replied, bad. Natalie then pulled out some notebooks and some pens and set a timer and they both got to work. They both wrote for half an hour, then they stopped and they read to each other and then they went for another half an hour. And by the end of that second round, they were both beaming. And to this, she says, writing practice had done it again digested our sorrow, dissolved and integrated our inner rigidity, and let us move on. And maybe this is why I, and maybe you too, are so obsessed with writing. Because writing can do what other mediums and other activities can't. We can reach different parts of our psyche and relish in the challenge of seeing whether or not we can pull off a narrative technique, and we can find satisfaction in the general practice of art making. When you give yourself to writing, the writing gives back. But writing is just one part of our life, and how we feed our writing is by living our life. If we constantly find ourselves checking out of social light situations, we'll soon find ourselves struggling to fill the blank page. We need to have deep conversations, follow our curiosity, explore and become educated on topics outside of writing, which means consuming content that is not about writing or writers. So instead of using writing as a fix for restlessness, maybe sit in that feeling and really think about how restlessness actually feels in the body. Then grab a notebook and write down in detail what it actually feels like. 
Now, maybe you'll use this content in a book one day or in an article one day, and maybe you won't. But by doing this, the writing at least is put in its place, and it becomes a supportive tool rather than an insidious device for productivity and potential dopamine hits. There is little division between my work and my life, and I cannot imagine not writing. But we can't compartmentalize our lives. Everything is connected and everything feeds into everything else. In order to have a good writing life, you need to have a good life, period. As Natalie Goldberg says, this is your life. You're responsible for it. You will not live forever. Don't wait. Well, that's all I have for you this week, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the subscribe button because it makes all the difference to visibility and how YouTube works. And it takes a lot of effort to make these videos and I'd so love any support that you can give towards it. Click the thumbs up if you liked it, leave a comment, all that good stuff, it all helps. Now, if you'd like even more writing advice, you can head to taraeast.com. And while you're there, consider joining my email newsletter, because when I do, I'll send you a free video training called the follow through formula, how to complete a long term writing project. I so hope you enjoyed this video, guys. Thanks for showing up and watching all the way to the end. Stay safe, stay calm and keep writing. And I'll see you again next week.